and uh, all of you folks. I, uh, I, I need someone to kind of help me a little bit as I get into this sermon, so if you'll just bear with the next uh, minute or two from, uh, to hear from this young man. That'll be good, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, so. <laughs> he doesn't want, and we don't want Kevin to get a spanking. Uh, and so that's. <laughs> so I'm uh, going to look at a uh, passage, uh, scripture in, in my Bible reading, uh, Proverbs 18, a little while ago, and, and how much it uh, spoke about the tongue and by implication, our, our ability to listen. Uh, and obviously there's a young man there who's, <laughs> he's not listening, and yet at the same time, he's crying out to be listened to. And so in a, uh, in a conference where we're highlighting, fanning the flame, I'm uh, wanting to maybe address something that might take some people out that could have been fanned into a flame, uh, and yet uh, some issues that weren't properly addressed or discouragement and hopelessness that can remain or just in conflict, like the emotional resources that are drained out of pastors and workers, disciples and uh, people, even in our own marriages and family. Uh, this text uses the word fool and it appears another three times in, uh, in the chapter. And we, we want to not be foolish as we approach the issues of relationship. And, and uh, this is actually a verse for our whole generation, but we're more concerned with uh, Pastor Kevin Foley, or, or Foley, no, no, fully. Uh, and so if, uh, if you'll read with me, Proverbs 18, verse 2, a fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. So let's think about the fool for a moment, because this isn't an issue of intelligence. This is an issue of character. The Proverbs uh, are full of wisdom for you and me. And the fool means spiritual insensitivity and willfulness. The careless ease of fools shall destroy them. So that hit the fool's spiritual dullness and willfulness is seen as his intention to speak his mind and heart and not care to listen to gain understanding of the person or the situation. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. 
The Amplified says, A closed-minded fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his personal opinions, unwittingly displaying his self-indulgence and his stupidity. A foolish person doesn't want to understand anything. He only, wants to, he only enjoys telling others what he thinks. And uh, I think we can all relate to times where we have done this. But these words can create great damage when we're just expressing our own hearts, but we are not listening. There's deep and a lasting influence of words ill spoken. Proverbs 18, verse 8, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They have gone down into the person's innermost being. That, that language there is this uh, to swallow greedily. There's a flaw in human nature. We all possess it and we have to address it. We love gossip. We have an appetite. We use the term juicy gossip because there's an appeal there. But what this says is when we listen to stuff we shouldn't be listening to, like something goes down deep inside of us, down to our innermost being. That means it's down where the, the source of our will and our relationship with God, our character and spirit are shaped by the words that we hear. You know, there's a bias in human nature. If you hear something good about someone and then you hear something bad about someone, it's very easy to make that transition. We can do that, but if you hear bad about someone and then somebody corrects you and tells you the good about someone, we have a hard time making that shift. It's just this flaw in human nature that bad words about people stick to us more permanently and they go down more deeply inside of us. These words can bring unendurable crushing of someone's spirit. Proverbs 18, 13, and 14, the one who gives an answer before he listens, that is his folly and his shame. A person's spirit sustains him through sickness, but who can bear a crushed spirit? Now, I've always looked at those Proverbs as two entirely separate things, and maybe they are. But it is just interesting that speaking before you really get the understanding of what's going on can crush someone's spirit. That is possible to happen. So uh, there, that means they're unequal to deal with the struggles of life and situations perhaps that could have been addressed if we were more listening rather than speaking, those issues don't get addressed and people leave crushed and hopeless. We're talking about a brother or sister that can be offended in a profound way. Verse 19, an offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city and quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. Words spoken by someone refusing to understand, doesn't want to listen and understand the person or the situation, can deeply damage a relationship that is nearly, according to this text, nearly impossible to repair. Verse, eight, verse, verse 6, I'm sorry, a fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calls for blows. And further, there is death. We know the text, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And that can mean spiritual death, individual, corporate, to a people, to a church, to relationship, to a family, to a marriage. 
Words can bring death or life. Talk too much and you will eat everything you say. And it's interesting that the next verse is about marriage. That be careful what you say. Be careful that you listen. And we've heard words are spirits. They can impart death's influence into our innermost being. Death at work. James says it this way, and, and you know, James is like the book of Proverbs for the New Testament in some ways. And uh, the message says, a word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A, a careless or wrongly, wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By your speech, you can ruin the world. Turn, the, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send a whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. It sets an entire life on fire with flames that come from hell itself. Those are pretty sobering words. And we all, we, we've all read them. Or many of us, you know, maybe you're a newer convert here and perhaps don't sense the enormity of what can be released in a life and released in a marriage, a family, a congregation. He's talking about careless words. How much more words that are intentional? <laughs> I, I mean to hurt you, right? I mean to humiliate or embarrass you. You know, the thought is there are people in all of our churches that aren't there to be set on fire and their, the fire fan into their flame because they have been consumed and lost by hell's fire that has been released by somebody's tongue. You know, uh, I had a very disturbing uh, phone conversation some time ago, and uh, we were dealing with uh, very serious matters. And I, but there was something different about this one. And as soon as I, uh, I was going to say hung up the phone, we don't do that anymore, right? <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as I clicked, I called Pastor Greg and said, I, I, yeah, I, I have to resign. Um, I can't do this. I am a loser, you know, and he, he's very forceful, but that's witchcraft, Kevin. <laughs> that is witchcraft. Don't, no, you don't receive that. And, and it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> and so he prayed, to, led me in a prayer, right? He said, you have to cast that down. You have to uh, renounce that. And you have to call the guy and tell him you renounce that. I was set free. And he related, he had the same experience when he was in Australia. And Pastor Mitchell having to yell at him, Greg, it's witchcraft. No, I've got to go. It's, and uh, obviously, we're glad that he made it through that. Huh? So let's think about a desire to understand because your capacity to understand has nothing to do with your IQ. Some people are so smart, they never learn anything because they already know everything. Pride comes before disaster, but humility before respect. Verse 12, had an evangelist brother, Valerio came and I, I liked the statement that he often made back when I used to know everything. I like that statement because that's, some people never say that. <laughs> they still think they know everything, but Understanding comes from humility. I don't know everything. I don't have ESP. I can't read your mind, right? I'm not a mind reader. I don't have precise discernment. And, uh, and so this verse leads us right into this desire to understand. Our text says that the fool takes no delight in understanding. He has no desire to understand. James 1.19, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, 
and slow to wrath. We are all so often very quick to speak. We're going we're gonna to get it out. And I have read many times, and you can dispute this. I'm not saying this is uh, doctrine. But I've heard people say the most important life skill that you can develop is the ability to listen. The most important life skill is to actually listen. You've got to want it, right? You've got to want to understand. That's, that's the sense of this. He delights in understanding. I want that. I want to understand you. I want to understand. I'm willing to listen. Begins with humility, that we don't understand any, everything, all things. Verse 13, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. One translation, listen before you answer. If you don't, you are being stupid and insulting. <laughs> and this one, let, every, let people finish speaking before you try to answer them. That way you will not embarrass yourself and look foolish. Why do we do this? Well, the, the number one reason is we get defensive. Because it's usually the stuff we don't like to hear is usually bad stuff about us <laughs> sometimes. And so we get defensive, and we're going to explain and justify, and we're going to, and, and so rather than hearing people out and acknowledge and letting them know that we've heard them, we start justifying and explaining ourselves. One thing, of course, we've mentioned it before, is our pride, right? We already know. I get you. I, I already know the situation. I, I know all things. But this is verse 2, like the fool is always expressing his own heart, right? All that he's about is what he, how, how he sees it. You know, if you're not a Tesla, you ought to listen, right? You don't have scopes going all around you, all around your life. We don't see everything. We don't know all things. Sometimes it's the attitude toward the, of the person. I don't like you, or I don't respect you, or I don't trust you, or I'm bitter toward you. Or I've, uh, you, you know, like we, we have that. And, and often it can just be our impatience. Right? There was an old TV show back in the day. I think it was even a radio show back in the day day and uh, uh, called Dragnet and Jack Webb was the detective and uh, he comes to the door of some some woman is uh, being very emotionally said just the facts ma'am <laughs> don't try that at home just just saying <laughs> there's people that won't get the whole story Verse 17, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Or the first person to tell his side of the story seems right, but that may change when somebody comes and asks him questions. A story sounds true and someone tells, until someone tells the other side and sets it straight. You know, we pastors know we can't counsel half a marriage, right? Like sometimes we have just comfort people and get them calm down and tell them to put the gun away. We, you know, we, we have to, you know, diffuse a situation. But in terms of actually solving, you've got to hear both sides, right? I'm sorry, no one person has the entire situation straight in his or her mind. It's just, it's, it's just not humanly possible. We can't settle ministry conflicts, right? Unless we're hearing both sides. You know, Pastor Mitchell always would tell us, you know, the thing that hurts our guys, we know how to preach, right? We know how to evangelize, we know it. It's our people skills. Like we're getting people saved and then we're killing them. 
And as uh, you know, Pastor Payne has preached to us before, like if, if you're killing converts, who's the first guilty party likely? <laughs> Pastor, right? And, and obviously disciples, all, all the others can be involved. But this is the thing, like this, this is a people skill to be able to listen and communicate that you've actually listened. Uh, there's a, a, I'm gonna show another video right now if you'll just permit me that a couple that was in a very apparently heated conversation and they needed some serious counseling and we wanna just uh, see if that can be a help to any of us. We all turn into monsters and eat everybody, right? <laughs> so, that's not gonna work. That's kind of the opposite of revival, huh? <laughs> so here's the fact that we can get help here, right? Because James tells us there's not a human being that's got this under total control, right? Like that, we, we need help. We need help to have a right spirit because so much of it just comes out of having a right spirit. Our spirit influences everything that we say and do. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, the great uh, prayer of the, the, uh, of the Old Testament, the, the Shema, you know, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, all your strength. Here, our relationship with God, our covenant with God, he wants us to listen. 
And you know what? We're in covenant with one another. Some people never get that. That we're in covenant relationship with one another. Walking away from this is breaking covenant. It's not just looking for greener pastures. And you know, that means we need to hear one another and beginning and really by the grace of God, love one another. To delight in understanding more than being understood you want to understand because we have certain instinctive powers that send the message we don't want to understand i remember pastor mitchell again counseling janet and me before we were married and uh, so he sets us in his office and and talked about a number of things but uh, one thing he said is uh, if you learn to talk to one another you'll settle your problems if you don't learn to talk to one another you'll be in talking to me and we've done that talk to him (laughs) and pastor greg (laughs) You know, I've preached on marriage all different places all over the world, I guess. But this is, this is the toughest one. To me, this is the toughest one. Maybe um, unique. But to really listen and make someone sense that you've heard and being able to communicate properly. We need supernatural help. You know, no man can bridle the tongue, the Bible says. And what does God do? <laughs> it, it, this, is, it, this is something so significant. What does God do when He baptizes us in the Holy Spirit? We speak in other tongues. Right? This thing that can be set on fire of hell can now be set on fire by God. Right? Now, <laughs> this tongue can be used for supernatural utterance. Not just speaking in tongues, but it matters. It so significantly matters. Like out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Something powerful is now at work in us. Someone powerful, I should say. And so these things about us that cripple our marriages and run people out of church and create division and strife and offended people. You know, we, we can get help. You know, the, the Spirit of God is also the Spirit of wisdom, right? He is the Spirit of understanding. Verse 15, the heart of the prudent acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. The Holy Spirit will help us with that. Now, I'm just going to say some practical things. This isn't a counseling session, please. Uh, uh, just understand. But just, just some things that have, that have helped me. And some of it is like the nonverbal stuff. Like one of the things that I have to ask God, if I dare, when I get it, is why get, did I get stuck with this face? <laughs> because it can contort into all kinds of hideous looking. <laughs> and, and you know what? Like facial expression is one of the most telling things in any conversation. Like it says more than words and it says more than tone of voice. And some of us are crippled. <laughs> like poker face, I, could, I would live on the street if I had to play poker. <laughs> right? Like it's, and so, but to be conscious, like I gotta be conscious. Watch your facial expressions. Watch your, your, like your, your, just your body language. You know, what, what? I didn't say anything. No, 
no. <laughs> yes, you did. I, I don't care. Right? I, I should have started with this. I'm sorry. Put your phone away. <laughs> Number one, put it in the refrigerator. Watch your tone of voice. You know, I guess they say, you know, tone of voice and facial expressions are both kind of linked to our uh, fight or flight thing in our brain, wherever that is. And so it's something uh, like we resist punching people. That's a good thing. So we can also resist our tone of voice and keep it respectful. And don't expect perfection from yourself and don't expect perfection from the person that you're listening to. Don't make the fight about the fight. Has <laughs> that ever happened to you? You know, you start arguing about who's gonna take out the trash and you're fighting about, and you said, no, I didn't say it, but you lived, and, and, and then, what did we start, how did this start? You don't even remember, because you spend the whole the time fighting about the fight. I, uh, so don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. And the person on the other side, don't go on for 30 minutes. <laughs> Don't interrupt, don't get defensive. Like, I'm gonna explain, that's how you feel, I'm gonna explain why you shouldn't feel that way. That doesn't work. We get defensive, we get dismissive. Have you had somebody uh, that finishes your sentences for you? And, and I think I kind of attract a lot of that because I talk slowly and my brain works very slowly. And so there are... <laughs> so they're trying to... <laughs> and I'm figuring like there's a 90% error rate. Like hardly ever does someone who finishes my sentence finish it like I was going to finish it. So if you're a sentence finisher, <laughs> just know that's probably true for you. I don't think that the people that are finishing your sentences are any smarter than the people that are finishing my sentences. And this is crucial. And, and actually, I guess this is a mental health issue, certainly, <laughs> for, for the people you're person you're talking to, but apparently it's a mental health issue for the listener. And that is, like, repeat back to them respectfully what they're saying. And I, I don't get the brain chemistry or whatever that is helped by that, but there's, they say that there's something about that. If, if you can do that, if you can let someone know before you answer, justify, explain, stomp out of the room, whatever you do, slam the car door, peel rubber down the street, before you do any, don't do any of that anyway, but just, so what, here's what I hear you saying, right? What I've heard from you is, is, is this, and don't be done. Yeah, so you're talking to me about, the, okay, so you're saying I'm the Antichrist. Okay, all right, I get it. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about authentic, right? And there's just something that's, that's gonna bring peace to your mind. It's gonna bring health to your mind and it's going to, because if folks feel understood, right? They, may, they might be wrong, right? There's a very good chance we are imperfect, flawed people. Nobody is going to be 100% right in anything. But don't dispute the accuracy before you've let the person know that you actually heard. 
because maybe you didn't hear. And maybe when they explain it again, maybe when you ask them, like clarifying questions, right? So what did you mean? And then you find out, you know what? You didn't have to be defensive, right? You didn't have the excuse or the justification you came up is irrelevant to what they're really dealing with. You ask like clarifying questions, like delight in understanding questions, not like leading questions or interrogating questions. Okay, and then what did I do? <laughs> you know, like, like it's, think of that word, like delight in understanding, delight in understanding. And then acknowledge their feelings. Acknowledge, you know, you're upset, right? You're, you're sad, you're, uh, you're, you're angry, you're discouraged, you're, um, and, you know, because our feelings mess with our brains, don't, don't they, right? Like, and, and sometimes if you're not going to actually be able to relate if somebody's emotions are still so much in play that they can't hear, right? When we get upset to a certain amount, like the, the, the rational part of our brain kind of shuts down and fight and flight, you know, kicks in. And so, but there's something, there's something about hearing from someone, yes, I, I, I see you're confused about that, I see you're upset, I see you're just discouraged about that, and, and you know, and there's no just one emotion going on in any of us, I think at any given time. Well, yeah, I'm angry, it's breast bummed out, you know, <laughs> like there's a few things going on. But there's something about just hearing that acknowledged, hearing that validated, not saying, you know, that is an accurate reading of the, the situation, but just, I hear, that's how you're, that it just calms them down, that they, they, they're feeling like you care and that you understand, and then their brain works better. And that, you want that, right? You want that. The reality is our feelings shape so much of our situation. And you know, our culture, has elevated how we feel to the number one indicator of reality. Now we think we get a pass on that because we believe that our reality comes out of this. But sometimes Christians make their decisions about reality in kind of the same ethic as people decide they're not really the gender that they were born with. That's hor I'm saying, some Christians, their ethic is more like that than this, because it's how I feel. To care and make them sense that you care. See, Paul writes, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who Though he were God, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and humbled himself and came, became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess as he is Lord. Let this mind be in you, right? This is... Right now, this is not about me. Let each esteem other better than himself. Okay? Let each esteem that, what that person's needs are. Your congregation member, your wife, your teenager, uh, co-worker, whoever that is. Right? If folks f sense that spirit, no, that, that's not perfect because some people are going to talk to you and their hearts aren't right and they, uh, you know, there's, there's no uh, disputing 
uh, there's no success in arguing with a rebel. Right, I I didn't use verse 12 because I I thought I might run out of time. But uh, it wasn't, where is it? It was verse one, I actually deleted it, right? Like the, uh, the, the fool likes uh, the one who isolates himself. The one who isolates himself seeks its own, his own way and snarls against all good judgment is the little translation. Snarls, right? Some people, that's all you're going to get, a snarl, right? And you don't have to endure that. But sometimes that's not what it is. It's somebody hurting and somebody that if you just get some time and listen. There was an, an actress who was offered a role that uh, required her to play in this, in this play a, 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 a young wife and mother who had lost her husband. Well, this uh, woman was going to play the part. She didn't have kids, didn't have a husband. And so she thought it'd be good to get time with some people that... Uh, uh, some uh, younger uh, women who had lost children or lost a husband. And, um, and so she's uh, talking with them and listening and then sharing her own insights and sharing her... Uh, and then it dawned on her that that wasn't really working, that she gradually realized it would be better for her to just stop talking and start listening with empathy to their stories. And because she listened with empathy, because she got it, she got where they were coming from, right? I I don't know how she did on the role, but at least she probably became a better human being. To, To listen with empathy. And thank God we have forgiveness where we've blown it, right? And we have help by the Spirit of God to transform the way that we relate to one another. Amen. That's, that's all that I have. Praise God. I want to thank Pastor Greg for the invitation uh, to preach once again in this conference. I don't take it lightly to be behind this pulpit. Let's get our Bibles out. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 22, verses 10 through 18, and then verses 21 through 29 we're going to look at. There's someone here this morning, you've been battling a curvature of the spine. You, you notice that there's a change, no doubt, taking place to your body as you age, but it's not normal. You're starting to hunch a little more. You act, actually spoke to a doctor, there is a a changing of your spine. God wants to heal you this morning. I'm not sure where you're at. It could be more than one person. Then I want to pray for someone here. You've been having miscarriages after miscarriages, and you cannot have a baby. God wants to touch your womb right now. Someone else here, right now, you've been going through treatment. You've been facing cancer in your body. God wants to bring a supernatural deliverance right now to your body. I want to believe God with you right now. God, I'm asking for the supernatural power of God to be at work right now. The straightening of the spine. That you're going to cause this womb to reproduce right now. You're going to move upon these bodies. I command cancer to die right now. God, I'm asking for a supernatural infusion of life in their body right now. I thank you for all that you're going to do in Jesus' name. Let it be done right now. Amen. For 30 years, there was an art forger named Mark Landis. He had made headlines for duping dozens of museums into accepting fakes into their collections. He admits as he has always had a mischievous streak when contacting museums, he would often use aliases and dress like a Jesuit priest, priest. With his odd demeanor and great knowledge of art, Landis could easily come across as an eccentric art collector. His skill with a pencil or paint brush was undeniable. 
often using a magnifying glass, Landis studies a print of an original work, and with meticulous attention to detail, he can copy exactly what he sees. Religious icons, impressionist or modern art, work, works of art. His recreation uh, in the style of the old masters are astonishing, and so are his tools. They include magic markers and pins and Walmart frames. Raw materials that proper forgers may not use. More than 45 museums could not tell the difference between Landis, his copies, and original works. Not only were his fakes convincing, but he knew exactly what to say when he met with these museums. As one museum director explained, Landis would imply he had more paintings he might want to donate and possible endowments from the family's estate. The museum director admits he knew right where to hit us our soft spot, art, and money. I want to preach on the danger of a replica. Kind of lengthy verses of scripture, but we'll go through that. When they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, built an altar there by the Jordan, a great impressive altar. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan. On the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Then the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the priest of the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, to the half tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, with, the, with uh, ten rulers, one ruler from each, uh, from the chief, rather, house of every tribe of Israel, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. When they came to them and they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away from this day from following the Lord, and that you have built for yourself an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us, from which we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away from this day from following the Lord, and it shall be if you rebel against the Lord that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Verse 21, Then the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, answered and said to the heads of the divisions of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, and let Israel know itself. If it is in rebellion or if the treachery against the Lord, if it, uh, in treachery against the Lord, rather, do not save us today. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings, or if to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account. But in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason. Notice saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, what have we to do with you, with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made Jordan a border between you and us, you children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord, so your descendants would make our descendants cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that if it may be a witness between you and us and generations after us, that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings. That your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore we said that it will be when we say this to, our, to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say, here is the replica of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, or for sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. So first of all, I'm going to look at the replica. Because our text tells a strange story. You have to understand that it's at the end of the conquest of the promised land. When Israel came into the land, there were two and a half tribes that wanted to settle on the eastern side of the Jordan. When they began to appeal to Moses about this, he allowed them to stay there. But he began to encourage them 
that you need to help the other tribes subdue the land west of the Jordan. And he said that they could only return to their homes once the fighting was done. So in Joshua chapter 22, the fighting ended and all of Israel gathered at Shiloh. And then Joshua releases the Transjordan fighters to return to their families. So when they left on their way home, they came to the Jordan River and here they did an odd thing. They stopped and they built a huge altar. The Bible says they patterned it after the altar at Shiloh where the tabernacle was. But remember that this was only a replica of the real thing. It was a copy of the altar that priests offered burnt offerings on. But it's amazing that these builders, they took liberty. And in this case, the Bible says they built a larger, more imposing version. Remember that the altar at Shiloh was a central part of their worship. It was portable. It was meant to be taken down and to be moved. But here what the Transjordan fighters built was permanent. It had size and it had substance. It had the appearance of the real thing. And the Bible makes it very clear that it was bigger. Size was not the only difference, but it was different in another way. And that was it was never meant to function as an altar. It was made to look like the real thing, to have the appearance of the real thing, but it was never intended to have sacrifices placed upon the altar. It was always just a replica of something that it would never be. When the other nine and a half tribes heard about it, they heard that there was another altar that was built in the land. They became distraught. They realized that this one rivaled the real one. They remember the command of the Lord in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Because Moses began to charge them that when you go into the land, you need to make sure there's no other altars in that land. And in fact, you need to bring them down or tear them down so that none are in the land except the one I choose to place my name. So at this point in the history of Israel, Shiloh was that place. And the word of the Lord was clear that there is to be no other place that co could coexist with Shiloh. No other altar could be allowed. They were commanded. If you see any other type of altar in the land, you can confront that and you need to bring it down. Yet here at the beginning of entering the promised land, we find these other tribes building an altar other than the altar of the Lord. Now all of a sudden, we find that there's civil war in the air. Fresh from the conquest of the promised land, they rallied their troops again and prepared to go to the Jordan to remove this altar. In that moment, we find that clear heads prevailed. An envoy with emissaries from each tribe that we just read about in our text, they go down to these Transjordan tribes. They carry the threat of war and they want an explanation. In the end, the Bible says that war was averted because this altar that was built... Remember, it was never intended for sacrifice. It had the appearance of the altar of the Lord, but remember that it lacked the substance. It was never to be a place of sacrifice. That means they cannot come with any type of animal and put it upon the altar and sacrifice it there. It was all of a sod. It was never meant to be stained by blood. It was never to have the stench of death or the sweet aroma of incense. It was a replica, remember, of something that it would never be. The two factions came together, and they said, okay, this altar can remain long as you don't sacrifice anything on it, but let it be a sign of unity between your tribes and our tribes. It was a witness that when all the other nine and a half tribes would look at them, they would recognize, okay, these people... They serve the same God that we serve. The altar was to remind future generations that these Hebrews living on the other side of the Jordan were just like them. They worship the same God with the explanation. And we find as they begin to talk about this and begin explain, explaining this, that the threat of the altar at that moment was diminished. 
the call of war was renounced. It was determined as long as there was no sacrifice that would be placed upon this replica, there would be no harm in having such an altar in Israel. Secondly, I'm going to look at Phineas. But I'm here to tell you this morning, an altar without sacrifice is a dangerous thing. It seemed good to leave this empty altar alone. Let's just let it stand for the sake of peace among the tribes. The truth is that that empty altar was a harbinger of things to come. When Joshua made his charge against the Transjordan tribes, he hit at the heart of the problem. With all the people involved in this account, only one person we find is called by name, and it's very notable. It's Phineas, the son of Eliezer. When you hear this name, you begin to think about another account in the Word of God. He's famous for another incident in Hebrew history. We know when Balak and Balaam tried to come against the people of God, we know Balak hired Balaam. And he says, I want you to come and I want you to begin to pronounce curses on the people of God. God put blessing instead of cursing in his mouth. Finally, out of irritation, the prophet told Balak, I cannot curse what God has blessed. So, you know, let's try something different. Let's try bringing in the loose women. Let's try to get them to dance before the men. I'm not sure what it was. We know it's provocative. I'm not sure if they painted on their pants. I'm not sure what they did, but we know they brought in the loose women. And the Bible says the men of Israel begin to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. And all the people begin to entertain the worship of the Moabite deity, the Bel, Bel of Peor. And the Bible says that in that moment, a plague was sent that killed 24,000 Israelites. And this plague continued until a man of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman... And in the sight of Moses and Israel, the Bible says it was Phineas who saw it. He takes a javelin, he goes after the man and the woman in the tent, and he thrusts them both through. And the Bible says that God is pleased. The plague stopped. So remember that this is the same Phineas now that looks upon the empty altar and he begins to cry out, is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us? So he's stating, in other words, did we not learn anything? He goes on to say something that's revelatory. He acknowledges that Israel was never truly cleansed from the stain of Peor. The tendency to chase after other forms of worship never completely left them. So this is the problem that would plague Israel for its entire history. Over and over... They'll seek satisfaction in places other than the house of God. When Phineas sees that empty altar, he sees an invitation to an empty religion, to depart from the worship of the one and true God. What others see as a token of unity, let's all just get together and have a good time and be in unity. He says, no, what I see before me, it is a stumbling block. Even though the matter is temporarily resolved, the foresight of Phineas proved to be true. The larger problem is in the presence of an altar, but what that altar represents. Despite the explanation given, remember that it represents a departure from the ways of God. Why will future generations need this altar to remind the rest of Israel that they are a part of the covenant of Moses? If the Transjordan tribes go to Israel on the Day of Atonement to offer sacrifice, won't they already know who they are and what they stand for? There is only one way they won't know them. That is if they stop showing up at the altar in Shiloh. Phineas saw the altar for what it really was. It was a half step in the wrong direction towards the law, or rather towards disobedience of the law. The compromise that was made there in the name of peace became the facilitator of the backsliding nation of Israel. You have to be careful when you make compromises. Oh, you know, we no longer do that anymore. We no longer have altar services. We do that in a side room. We no longer speak in tongues behind the pulpit. We no longer 
want to associate ourselves with being Pentecostal. You have to be careful this morning because time will reveal that the empty altar was a forerunner to ignore the law, to do things their own way. It was perceptive that Phineas recognized that this altar resulted in the wrath of God on the entire nation. So I want to look at what I really want to preach on. That is the danger. The prelude to the fall of Israel and the captivity to come, the prelude to judgment of those who were once the apple of God's eye, remember it is an altar that was never intended for sacrifice. A seed is planted in that moment. This undermines the very foundation of a nation. We find that forever they'll struggle with the tendency to see the religion as too demanding. We have to go to one place. We have to go to one source. Why can't we have our own altar here? Why do we have to keep going back to the original thing when we can deviate and do our own thing? As something that holds them back from the real pleasures of life. We just want to have a good time. It's too demanding what you're asking of us. And they begin to turn it in a way that the original looks like legalism. Over and over, they forsake the true worship to pursue the idols of this world. What is the other people doing? I want to watch what they're doing so we can begin to incorporate what they're doing into what we're doing. We're too ashamed to do that. We're too ashamed to act like that or sound like that. We have matured. We have developed past that. All because of an altar with no sacrifice on it. Without a sacrifice on the altar, remember, there is no fire. Listen, there is an inherent danger in growing comfortable with having a replica of religion in your life. And we're all guilty this morning. We know how to just pray. and uh, uh, We know how to come to church and lift our hands, look around, watch people. We know what it is to skim through some scriptures acting like we're reading our Bible. We are all guilty in some way of having a replica in our life. But when Paul warned Timothy of how things would be in the last days, listen to what he said. He's talking about believers. He's talking about the church. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. And notice verse 5, he caps it off with this. This speaks of the church in the last days, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. So Paul is looking ahead to a day. He says there will be some who will pretend to be religious, who will give the appearance of being on fire, but their lives will prove that it's all a myth. And what he begins to target at is that they'll have all the appearance, but not the power. They will have the form, they will have all the structure, but they will not have the substance. They will embrace the visible expression of religion. They'll claim association with the people of God. They want the world to see them that, hey, we are religious too. We're doing what God has called us to do. But then... They're not willing to take the necessary steps in their lives to truly walk with God. They have big altars. They have impressive altars. They have technology. They have impressive buildings. They have great song service, service teams. And they begin to declare to all, I'm just like you. I go to church too. I'm a part of the fellowship. But in truth... Where is their sacrifice? Where is the fire of the Holy Ghost? They know how to worship. We see it all the time. They got the form down, but their worship has no substance. They're hollow on the inside when you begin to flick it. They can say all the right things. They can go through all the motions, but they're just paying lip service to God. The Bible says that, yes, you can say the right things, but remember your heart is far from me. God help us. This is a danger of an empty altar with no sacrifice on it. An altar that is never stained by blood, where there's no dying that ever happens, where there is no fire that falls. 
You can carry on the pretense of being Pentecostal. But an altar with no sacri uh, sacrifice, remember, it has no power. Make no mistake, the power of an altar is always, always, always in the sacrifice. It's not in the architecture. It's not looking at the grand si size of the building or the imposing presence of the latest technology. Remember, the power of the altar is number one. The sacrifices that are made there. Number two, the covenant that it represents. And thirdly, most importantly, it is the God that resides there and puts his name there. It's more than just words. It's we coming. Oh, we've come because we want a dimension of God to be imparted. We want the Spirit of God to move and impact lives. I've come this week because I know just like you, I need God. I need to hear from God. I need to respond to the altar. I need impartation in my life. And that can only come when we come before God and lay a sacrifice on the altar. Remember, it's demonstrated. God answers by fire. He pours out anointing on the altar but only when the proper sacrifice is placed there. In the last days, the Bible says there's going to be an apostate church. They have all the form down. They know, tell you when to stand, when to sit, when to do your golf clap, when to look at your watch, when to decide what's for lunch, when to go to the altar for your 20 seconds. They have all the form, but they have no spiritual power or authority. What that tells me, well-meaning people, they're going to miss out with God. They'll become so deceived that they will believe that an empty altar is all it takes to identify them with the people of God. They're horribly wrong. It takes more than just the form to be the people of God. It takes the substance. Pastor Mitchell would always say, if you're going to be what we are, then you have to do what we do. It takes sacrifice. This conference is all about sacrifice. It's about these couples that are going to be launched, those that are going to walk down the aisle. We applaud them. We uphold that. But remember, they are living sacrifices. What keeps our fellowship on track is this very thing that we come together every six months and we offer fresh sacrifices on the altar of service. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is why Paul said, I die daily. I die daily. Because an altar without sacrifice is nothing. And I've come to admonish you this morning. Don't ever settle for an empty altar in your life. There is a real danger of being lured into apathy about the things of God. And it begins with the neglect of the altar in your life. In the book of Revelation, when the Lord looked upon the anemic church of Laodicea, remember what he said. I know your works. That you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So the, then because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Sacrifice is costly. If your altar is empty, you are giving God less than your best. The road to apostasy, remember, starts with an empty altar. The charge against the Laodicea church wasn't that they had grown so cold or that they had lost the appearance of being the church. What did God say? He said, i rather that you were either one or the other. And in fact, I wish you were cold. At least then I might have a chance of getting through to you. The problem is when we think we're okay. We're not all the way hot. We're not all the way cold. We're somewhere in the middle. I go to conference. I go to the fellowship church. I'm here, ain't I? And we're somewhere in the middle, and we cannot even recognize our condition. The problem with this church is that they were living somewhere in the region between hot and cold. And the Bible makes it very clear that God wishes you are one or the other. Don't be lukewarm, because lukewarmness reviled God. They had an altar. They had the appearance of religion. They had the form of worship. But where was the sacrifice? So let me get right down to it this morning. In closing, examine your altar. Ask yourself, where is my sacrifice? Where is the fire? 
When I go to church, I'm looking for the fire of the Holy Ghost. You know what I tell God? I say, God, have your way. I want gifts of the Spirit to be in operation every service, and if not, I'm going to try to believe for it. I need the fire of the Holy Ghost. We cannot continue to do what we do without that fire. Are you comfortable maintaining an altar that doesn't cost you something? Are you comfortable with an altar that does not require any kind of sacrifice? How long has it been since a fire fell on your altar? How long has it been since you prayed through? How long has it been since you travailed over your children? How long has it been since you pushed away the plate and fasted? I want to ask you this morning, what kind of shape is your altar in? We have come to the conference and we can appear that we have it all together, that we have these mega ministries. But let's be honest, the fire is barely flickering. What we need is God to ignite it again. And that comes by responding to the altar. That God, you can do whatever you want to do. You can convict me in any way you want to convict me. You can stir me in any way that you want to stir me. My life is yours. And I give everything I am to this cause and to the will of God. How many know for the fire to come upon you, you have to believe in what you're doing. I believe in this fellowship. I wouldn't be here. I'm not half-hearted about this. I believe in my pastor. I believe in Pastor Greg. I believe in our vision. I believe in what we're doing. I would not be here if I didn't believe in it. You have to be in all the way. Let me say it another way. The only way Holy Ghost people can ever become comfortable with no fire is when they learn to become comfortable with an empty altar in their lives. If we're going to be the light, it starts with fresh fire on the altar. It starts with personal sacrifice. It starts with your altar. By you coming to God this week, every service we're giving, given rather, an opportunity to respond and to come, to kneel our need, to humble ourselves before God and identify that we need the fire of the Holy Ghost. We can't afford to be comfortable and satisfied with a replica. There must be a real altar. It's more than just saying, oh yeah, we, we have that structure. We, we're like our mother church. No, we need the substance. What has carried the Prescott Church all these years is sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. And every time there's sacrifice, it is ignited by the Holy Ghost. There must be a real altar with real sacrifice this morning. And I want to challenge young couples and young men this morning. You want to do something for God in your life. And I felt challenged when I prayed that God was going to ignite these young men and young couples here this morning. I want you to stand right now. You want to do something for God. You come to this conference, you're not thinking that way, but right now you're going to make a declaration that I'm going to respond to the call of God. I'm going to do whatever it takes because I want to be a living sacrifice that is set on fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. We can change the world. We can change the world by these men. We can change the world. Thank God we have thousands of churches, but there's more to be accomplished. We haven't even scratched the surface yet. And I want to pray for these men right now. God, I'm asking for you to touch these young men, young couples right now. By the power of the Holy Ghost. God, I'm asking right now, set their lives on fire. Let us go back to the original source. And that is the fire of the Holy Ghost. God, I'm asking right now as they respond, as they yield to you, that you're going to do a work within them right now that is undeniable. They're going to go back to their churches and their cities. They're going to set their towns and cities on fire for God. God, I'm asking right now to breathe upon these sacrifices right now. I would say to my people today, know that I've called you for such a time as this. And even as the world gets darker and darker, know that I'm looking for my church to arise and stand in the power of my spirit. And know as you begin to respond and lay down thy life before me, know that I will set it on fire. 
that people will turn to you, that they will see that your life is different from what they have experienced. And know this morning that I'm igniting my men, I'm igniting my women, I'm igniting my couples this morning. And as you yield to my spirit, as you yield to my power, know that I will set your life on fire and I will use you to a great degree and I will use you to great effectiveness in thy city, thus saith God. Oh, God, we thank you right now. Hallelujah. You can be seated. I want to pray for someone here. You've been having lower back pain, spine pain, your tailbone area. You actually came this morning kind of walking in pain. And it's hurting you right now. God's going to heal your body. There's someone else here. You've been struggling with a lump in your throat. It's like a growth. And even when you eat and swallow, you can feel that. That's going to leave right now. It's going to melt by the power of God. There's someone else here. You have tumors in your body. Not just one, but multiple tumors in your body. It's going to melt right now by the power of God. It's going to leave. And I want you to give God praise when that happens. Check yourself after this. There's someone else here, you've been struggling with blurriness. It's like your vision is starting to change. You try different glasses. And every time you get a new pair, it doesn't work. You have to keep changing prescriptions. God's going to heal your eyes right now. You don't know what it is. You feel it's connected to your blood, but you're not sure. But God's going to set you free right now. There's someone else here, you've been struggling with uh, the, the ligament in your legs, like a, a part of your uh, back of your leg area. It's like you cannot stretch your legs completely. It's a tremendous pain that comes, the back part of your leg. God's going to touch you right now that you're going to be able to stretch that out completely. And sometimes it bothers you even sitting in this conference body. You have to get up. You have to go stand in the back. God's going to heal you right now. I want to pray for someone. You have an incurable blood disease. It's more than just one. God told me to generalize that. God is going to heal you if you believe it right now. There's an anointing that is going to destroy the yoke. You've come. You've been taking medication. You've been battling with this. But God is going to set you free right now. There's someone else here, you've been battling mind assaults. It's more than just, you know, devil harassing you, but you, you have a thought about your life that you're going to end in such a way that it's going to be so humiliating that it's even going to mock Christianity, that you're going to be a fool, that everybody's going to laugh at you because you're supposed to be a Christian, but you're acting like this. God is going to set you free from those thoughts. Right now, God, I'm asking for delivering power. I command these tumors to melt. The anointing de destroys the yoke. God, I'm asking right now for this presence to permeate this place. That you're going to go row by row, aisle by aisle. I speak resurrection, life, and power into these bodies. I command uh, this lump to melt right now. I command, Lord, this leg to be healed, the back to be healed. These thoughts to go right now. God, I come against every assault from hell. The devil is a liar. We rebuke his lies. We cast down every imagination, every fantasy that is not of God. I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's worship God for just a moment. Hallelujah. In the last six months, there's been a spirit released that can wait for just a moment. There's been a spirit that's been released upon pastor's wives specifically. Not only pastors, but pastor's wives. It's quitting. We heard from Pastor Foley, great message, but it is a spirit. It's more than just thoughts, you know, I'm not cut out for this. But it's been something that has been released from last conference, and you're still facing that to, to this day. And it's the thought of quitting, that I'm not cut out for this, I'm, I'm a terrible example, I'm no good, my past is so terrible that I'm not someone to emulate. That's a lie from hell. There's some of you right now, you want to quit. You've been telling your husband, I can't go any further, and, and as a pastor, you know, you're only strong as your marriage, we know that. But God's going to help you right now. I want you to stand. There's some of you right now, you're asking God to touch you. There's no shame in standing. We've all been there one time or another, feeling like we're not adequate for this. God's going to touch you right now. It's a spirit. This heaviness is going to leave right now. God, I command this to go. I take dominion by the blood of Jesus. I speak to the spirit right now that it's going to leave their minds. 
you foul oppressing demon that seeks to oppress and depress right now, I command you to go that you're going to leave their minds. You're going to leave this conference body. God, I thank you that you're going to bring a spirit of encouragement, a spirit, Lord, of power into their lives. And we thank you for all that you're going to do right now. Let it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. It's done. Praise God. You can be seated. God bless you. Thank you for listening to me. What a great conference we had. Let's give a Lord a hand of praise as our pastor comes. Thank God for that ministry. We are going to go into our break uh, before you make the mad dash to your jelly-filled goodness. Uh, there is no food or drink to be brought back in here. Only water is acceptable. Please uh, keep that in mind. Keep an eye on your children as well. Please listen for the music to start uh, for the final seminar. We will start 30 minutes from now, so please uh, be attentive to that. Uh, let's pray. Father, help us, and we thank you for all that you're doing. God, bless this time of fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 